So today I want to introduce you to what we've been doing uh, in a field of how we can apply AI to do something very creative, how we can actually use it to design drugs. So I've um, extended to the company uh, based in Oxford in the UK, and I want to show you uh, the work we've been doing over the past few years to develop this concept. So what's been driving us is the sheer number of barriers in taking ideas from academia uh, and bringing them to actually products to the market for, for patients, new medicines. So it actually takes over 30 years from an idea to originate in the labs of an academia somewhere in the world to eventually become a new medicine on the market. In fact, 15 of those years are inside pharma companies, five years in di discovery, 10 years in development usually, but it actually takes actually another 15 years prior to that before a project is often even started. And the reason being that, that it uh, is actually is at least a seven mil $70 million investment to have, um, create even the first prototype drug molecule that just goes into toxicity testing before it even gets into human trials. So therefore, we have this large economic barrier that means that a lot of validation work, a lot of confidence needs to be built up in the idea before people are prepared to take that investment. So we can think about how we can lower those economic barriers. Potentially, we can bring ideas forward faster. So this, this time barrier means that many of the potential ways we're going to treat Alzheimer's and many of many of uh, neurodegenerative diseases and other cancers already exist today, but they're just not being translated because of the confidence required before we make those investments. The other thing we need to challenge is actually there's over 7,000 diseases known to man. You know, over 6,000 of these are what we call orphan diseases. And the challenge of these is actually these very small patient populations means that often the economics of a situation, we have to charge sometimes hundreds of thousands and the first million dollar drug is now being produced. So therefore, if we can think about how, again, we can change the economics of drug discovery, we therefore open up so many more diseases to have, um, being tackled economically uh, by science. And the wealth of opportunity that lies in front of us is that the past 100 years of medicine has only actually targeted only about 1% of the proteins expressed by the entire human genome. So there's another potential up to 99% of unexploited opportunity, how we could perturb and modulate cells and, uh, 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 and phenotype, which we haven't yet even begun to tackle. So this is where the past 100 years of medicine and pharmacology has taken us. The challenge in that translation lies in economics and productivity. So it costs at least $2.6 billion at the moment to bring a drug to market. For some companies, it actually costs a lot more. And uh, our success rate is only around 12% to actually even when we get into entering human trials. But we need at least 20 projects starting off for beginning for one of them to go all the way through. And we often have to make and synthesize and test to at least two, two, two and a half thousand different experiments on different projects, uh, compounds to be made and tested for one of them ultimately and one project to move forward. So that's two and a half thousand times 20 molecules need to be made and tested to bring a drug. And even in discovery, it takes at least five years to, from, from this early stage. What this means economically is that the return on investment for pharma has been declining year on year on year for the past decade. In 2010, you could get nearly a 10% return uh, on pharma investments. Today, it's only 1.9 and dropping every year. There's no reason why that can't even go below zero. So the paradox we face is that during this time, we've actually seen an incredible revolution of technologies. Uh, everything from structure-based drug design, sequencing of a human genome, lower in cost of sequencing, uh, all the way through to now the ability with CRISPR to modulate and engineer uh, human cell lines. But none of these new technologies have had any impact in the declining year-on-year -year productivity of a farm industry. So the paradox is why? We believe actually the paradox lies in the limiting step in all of this, and that is human cognition. So where we're in position now is that a scientific team, when faced with trying to discover a new drug, has more and more data streams, more and more data, and different varieties of data, which they now need to analyze to formulate hypotheses from. So as they have more tools in front of them, they also have more decisions and more data to analyze. And the thing we haven't changed is our ability to analyze that data and to draw hypotheses from it. That's where we set off an extent here to try to change. How then do we start to automate drug design, not by just integrating the data, but generating hypotheses and actually doing the creative act of designing molecules themselves? And hopefully by doing so and letting the algorithms do it, we'd be in a far more productive position to go from an idea to developing a drug that goes into human trials far quicker and cheaper than it's currently been the case. So to tackle this problem, we actually 
it's actually a problem of how do you start to mimic creativity. Drug design is a creative endeavor. And what we're trying to produce here is a precision engineered product. That's what a drug is. It has to satisfy dozens of different criteria about which proteins you want to hit, which ones you want to avoid, does it want to get into a brain, how long, half-life, how long do you want it uh, expressed in, in the blood for it to have an action. All of these are dozens of criteria which need to be engineered into a product for it to be fine-tuned, for it to um, uh, be, uh, get to market and be safe and efficacious. So the way we thought about this then is how then could we begin to mimic human creativity? And human creativity has several attributes that we can start to mimic algorithmically. So firstly, you need to define your objectives. Here, our objectives I defined are uh, all the properties we need required to be a drug. And here, there's at least 20 objectives uh, on this page here, which we are aiming towards, where we want to get most of them against um, zero, but one at the end we want to, we want to hit. So we, want to get this, uh, we basically want to get one peak and flatline everywhere else. The other thing we want to do then is think about how we generate ideas. And this is where we want to think about generative technologies, everything from evolutionary approaches to uh, latest deep, uh, neural net approaches. But in fact, we, we are big fans of evolutionary approaches for many reasons. And the third part of it is how do you choose, sorry, what is good? How do you decide if you were doing something creative, an artist needs to decide when painting a picture if it's any good, a musician, whether or not the music being created fits with a concept of beauty. And here our concept of beauty is defined by our models. The data we can generate, and actually models against potentially thousands of different proteins in the human body, which we can then modulate uh, and measure in silico. When it's doing this then, so we, this is an evolutionary approach, and what we're doing here is evolving a compound until we reach a point where we satisfy all our criteria as closely as possible. This is work we published in Nature, and the exciting thing about this, this was the first time that we believe a molecule was filed for patent, which had been generated by artificial intelligence. So we showed in the proof of concept that new molecules which satisfy a defined set of criteria could be produced and were novel enough to be patented. What it's allowed us to do then, whoops, so go to the next page, <clears throat> was we then started to develop a technology and start to then understand what is the key technological problem that we're trying to solve. So we have heard a lot about big data at this conference, and in fact, in drug discovery now, we have a huge amount of data from genome sequencing, over a billion interactions in the protein data bank we can mine, etc. millions of compounds and their pharmacological properties now available in public data sets. But in fact, drug discovery is actually a small data problem, not a big data problem. What we mean by that is, whenever we want to create a new medicine against a, a, a new sort of uh, disease target, the chances are that it's one of the 21,000 genes in the human genome, for which, as I said, for which 99% we have little or no data. So therefore, when you start in a project that is actually going to be an innovative drug, the chances are you have very little or no data to start a project with. The question then is, is how then do you learn from small data sets? And this we see as being the fundamental challenge. And in fact, one of the focus of a company in the past few years has been very much to think about algorithms around the concept of active learning, and I would go as far as to say, even to this audience, that I believe in this, this domain, drug discovery, active learning is actually far more important in a technology than deep learning uh, because of a problem we're trying to solve, which is how do you start off with just a handful of data points and learn our way quickly into a, in, into a solution. So I'm just going to give you an, uh, an example of this as a, as a sort of a cartoon using some real data. So this is a, of, um, a data set that we got from GSK. It's of uh, 2,500 compounds, just like a drug discovery project we saw earlier. And we're going to start off with the least active compounds. These are incredibly weak. If, these, if this was actually a drug, you'd probably have to take a tablet this big for, to have any effect. And what we're going to do is start off a predictive model, which effectively is zero. So blue means inactive. And as we start to see red, we start to predict activity. So we start off with just 10 data points in our data set. We can't use any other external data. We're only going to learn from the data we're going to generate. And as we run it then, and we start then to make a prediction, test that molecule, bring the data back into the mole mole uh, system and do it again and again, we start off with what we call first an exploratory space. We want to explore the space. Here we've just arranged it so we can see it, our most active molecules are clustered towards the top, so you, your human eye then can start to see it. And by exploring the space, even within only less than sort of 50 compounds, we've already got a pretty good model about where we think activity is going to lie. Then we move into what we call exploitation phase, and now we're really going to drill down and try to make every compound to be as active as possible. And now you start to see every compound we start to make now is really filling up the area where the most active compounds are being found. 
Now, we're thinking about this active learning approach where every molecule is updating the model, and we, we actually are thinking and asking a question about what data I should collect next. That's what really we're asking. What should be the data point that would give me the most information I should annotate and add to a data set to be the most effective way to search that space? So what we found, actually, then, with this active learning approach, you only needed less than 10% of the data to find all of the most active compounds, and here is a fall as a magnitude increase in potency compared to where we started. So far more efficient than a brute force sort of methodology. We then can apply these methodologies then, for, and we created then a head-to-head. -head. We wanted to do our sort of Kasparov deep blow kind of moment. And here then we took a, um, a system where we took an existing historical project, which cost about $20 million to do, and uh, we then gamified it. And we then took um, you know, 10 uh, experienced uh, drug designers and basically allowed them to say, you can only pick, say, uh, 10 compounds to start off with. What would be the next 10 compounds you want to make and test, et cetera? And actually, we can't use any external data. Uh, we can only use the data that is presented in front of us. You have to learn within this particular data set. And actually, human drug designers are pretty damn good at this. But what you saw is that the first generation of the algorithm beat 9 out of 10 human chemists. And in fact, the latest version of the algorithm now beat all 10 out of 10 human chemists, particularly when we include active learning on top of the AI-based design which we showed earlier. So this then becomes the basis, we believe now, of having the evidence that machines designing drugs can now outperform human drug designers doing so. But this is a retrospective study, and how does it look if we start to perform things prospectively and actually bring in real drugs to the clinic? We've actually now started to do that. So this is the first four projects where we've now delivered what are called drug candidate prototype drugs now into of, um, uh, IND enabling studies. These are the toxicity tests we do just before it goes into human. And of these four studies, we can now benchmark these against the, uh, the industry benchmarks. So we effectively did each project in about a year from start to finish, and the industry average is around four and a half to five years. The industry average is about 2,500 compounds we made and tested. We were doing this on average at about 500 compounds, and more recently, even far less. And if we take those metrics and apply it to the economic model we saw earlier, which was uh, basically around 20 projects required to bring a drug to market, you plug those numbers in, and you're actually looking at about a 30% cost reduction in the cost of bringing a drug to market. So that's effectively around 30% of our $2.6 billion cost, which we showed earlier. So this one, we believe now, is a real first evidence of the impact of AI can have on actually the true sort of value proposition it can apply in, in the area of drug discovery. And we have a stage now where we're hoping of the two most advanced ones moving forward. We'll have now the first molecules moving into the clinic uh, uh, next year. So where we are now is that we really believe that this is how drugs are going to be discovered in the future. And the question then is, is what next? How then do we start to scale this up? And how then do we think about, ultimately, do we start creating the operating system for the farm industry to then actually deploy this far wider? And thanks for your time. It's been a great audience.